With the minimally invasive foot and ankle surgery technique, I have my three favorite ways to treat uh, bunion deformity. Number one, simple bump off. Well, it's not simple, it's less complicated. So bump off of first metatarsal, and then um, with or without akin type osteotomy at the proximal phalanx. Uh, again, with or without uh, lateral release, which is adductor release. Number two way is the uh, reviridination bunionectomy, which is my go-to MIS bunion procedure, which you will see um, in this video more in detail. Number three way is the reverse V, reverse chevron, or reverse Austin type of a bunionectomy that um, it can correct the IM angle and you know from mild to moderate type of bunionectomy with or without akin type osteotomy kind of same as the as the other one if you want to watch more detail on reverse austin or reverse v chevron type mis osteotomy watch this video to to see more detail but like i said in this video we're going to focus on revered in aisham bunionectomy which is my go-to mis bunion procedure and this is very special because I had the uh, privilege and honor to invite the actual inventor of Revered in Aisham procedure, Dr. Stephen Aisham, to my webinar I did in the past. And um, he's my mentor and I always bring him to uh, my big events for MIS Cadaver Lab in the previous five years. But you will see uh, more in depth his insights, his philosophy about minimally invasive foot and ankle surgery, and also I'll give you um, I'll give you short presentation of revered Aisham bunionectomy in that presentation. Are you ready? Let's dive into the presentation. Things were good until like 2012. You all agree with me? Insurance reimbursements are going down. And I found myself running three clinics, many employees, seeing 30 to 40 patients a day just to meet my revenue needs. So around 2013, 14, I was about to quit. You know, I, I had a major burnout. I just wondered myself, what am I doing here? I went to uh, MIS Cadaver Lab in 2014, and I met Dr. Aisham. So that was the, my big turn point, epiphany uh, moment for me. I saw minimally invasive foot surgery for the first time, uh, directed by Dr. Stephen Aisham. And for some reason, I just immediately knew this was the path I needed to take. So I went all in from that point, I went, basically from typical traditional open surgery at the hospitals and surgery center to minimally invasive exclusive foot surgery at the office space surgery suite. I knew that was my niche. I knew that was my specialty that I want to promote and my gut intuition was correct. I started attracting more patients to my office and start creating great results with minimal invasive foot surgery. Again, I'm so thankful that I met Dr. Aisham when I was about to quit and you know change my career to uh, real estate and Korean barbecue joint. I'm 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 not joking. So you see some pictures here, my journey with Dr. Aisham, um, just to my small way of gratitude for what he has done to me, um, I wanted to hand down his legacy, his vision to uh, promote and educate our colleagues with minimally invasive foot surgery. So I started programs, uh, MIS accelerator program, and I started hosting and organizing uh, minimally invasive foot surgery cadaver labs, as you can see in these photos. And just to uh, introduce Dr. Sivan Aisham, uh, he has devoted his career not only to practicing minimally invasive techniques, but also as a professor of surgery to teach these procedures at United States and abroad. 
His influence is prominent in pretty much all over the world. America, of course, South America, Europe, and Asian countries. Um, he has pioneered and published articles on many of the minimally invasive surgical procedures currently in use, and several of these techniques actually bear his name. So um, again, to thank him, he was he is always invited as a head lab instructor of my cadaver labs that I'm hosting in Chicago. As you can see, he's helping hundreds of colleagues with hands-on, actually hands-on guidance. And these are some photos from past four years. Um, these are attendees um, almost close to, I believe it was like 70 uh, attendees and we had 12 uh, faculty and you can see the photo of actual cadaver lab um, the, at the venue in Chicago. So please let me introduce Dr. Steven Aishan and Dr. Aishan, please turn on your camera if you don't mind. Awesome. Well, Dr. Aishan, again, I, it's uh, my honor to invite you to be a, a guest speaker um, of our event. Um, please um, say hello to everybody, if you. Hello, it's indeed my pleasure, and it, I feel privileged to be here with TJ and to spare some time uh, with you doctors. Oh, I mean, that's a really good uh, compliment. Uh, I, have you, I, for you. I have your revered in Aisham uh, first metatarsal osteotomy small presentation on behalf, on your behalf. Okay. When was that developed? Okay, I did that. I started doing that. Well, when I was doing the Austin, uh, procedure. I would do a, kind of like a mini open and do the uh, cut so I could see it. And in my hands, I had to fixate it. So I wired it in place. And then I, I said, well, I did my Aikens. And like I said before, my Austins were uh, that I did an Aiken with it turned out better. And I also did things like uh, for bilateral, I would do a uh, uh, modified McBride memo, basically Aiken procedure and one foot and the other foot, I would do a traditional Austin procedure. And I would compare the results. And uh, uh, very frequently the patient would say, well, why didn't you do this minimal invasive procedure on both feet instead of the one open it up? And uh, for a long time, uh, they looked, uh, it looked better and it functioned better. The patient had less pain. So I uh, moved that direction. But anyway, by doing those, you know, I corrected the intermediate, didn't uh, correct much the intermediate angle. I did an Aiken to get the toe straight. I removed the bump. I did uh, that lateral release or adductor release. And I didn't do anything about the PASA. That wasn't popular at that time. Even with Austin's, that wasn't popular at that time. And um, uh, with my recurrences, I put down, well, why am I having these recurrences? And uh, the big, big thing that stuck in my mind was the PASA. And uh, so back in about 1980, 81, I mean, I tried with the Austin to try to correct the PASA a little bit by uh, wedging it to some extent before we pushed it over. But uh, it was a little more complicated. So I decided to say, well, maybe if I just do a reverdant and, uh, but MIS, maybe I won't get the problems associated with the reverdance, which was a re reduced range of motion. But I did get reverse, uh, reduced range of motion, even doing the reverdant. So I looked at the x rays and a reverdant for those is you have a, uh, a cut through the head that goes from the end of the cartilage, functional cartilage on, on the dorsal aspect of the metatarsal head, straight perpendicular down to the weight bearing surface. And that cut would end up going through the plantar surface of the head, just distal to the sesamoid bones. And so as the patient moved their dorsal flex, their hallux, the sesamoid bones would run into the osteotomy site and uh, 
you ended up with hallux limitus or restriction to range of motion. And so that was a problem even if I did it on my S. So I thought, well, what can I do? Because the x-rays look better, uh, toes look better, but I had that problem. So I decided to change the direction of the osteotomy from dorsal distal at the end of the cartilage of the dorsum down to behind the sesamoid bones. And uh, that's an angle that we call dorsal distal to plantar proximal, which is a really good angle because as you bear weight, you are compressing your osteotomy site. Mm -hmm. So you do not need to have fixation. And also you are inside the joint capsule. And as with most MIS procedures, you will notice that uh, we call intrinsic fixation where the body extensors and flexors and, and all that muscles will actually tighten up to protect the fractured bones or your osteotomies, uh, the mother's nature's way. So uh, anyway, that's part of the fixation. But that's, that's how I, I started with that. I, I, di I did a, a series of about a thousand, no, not quite a thousand. The first time I got it published, I had was teaching uh, residents and, and uh, one of my residents said, well, doc, you better publish this because if not, somebody is going to steal it from you. <laughs> so, God, I got to publish something. How do we do that? But anyway, I ended up publishing it in a podiatric uh, journal called Current Podiatric Medicine. And it was published in 1985. I see. And then uh, my next publication on that procedure was published in uh, clinics of uh, podiatric uh, surgery in uh, the ends of the 1990s. There was a, a book on minimal basic surgery. So I was invited to publish that. And at that time I did put in a study of a thousand cases, which was uh, pretty remarkable, but uh, how the results were. But uh, I learned at that time too, that as Dr. Isham, who invented the Reverton Isham procedure, that you don't do studies on it because the studies don't mean as much, regardless of how well done or whatever it is, well, he may have cheated. So I decided from then on out that any studies that would be done would be done by somebody else, okay? So that's why most of the studies that I've done are done by uh, our orthopedic colleagues uh, in different parts of the world, okay? Awesome. Well, I'll let you take a little break. Um, so how is it so far, guys? If you guys... I'm going to uh, give you a little quick presentation on um, the one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best MIS, uh, not because he's in front of me. Well, this is my go-to choice of first metatarsal osteotomy and doctors who's working with me or who are in my group, my accelerator group, elite group, mastermind, they know how much I love revered denation procedure. So I made a quick presentation, borrowed some of his slides as well from Dr. Aisham. So let me share this screen with you guys. In any rebroadcast, this is copyright, guys. So do not share any uh, slides and you know information here on any other place. Um, I appreciate it. So you know here difference between open and MIS. This again strictly for doctors who are kind of new to MIS. Open typical traditional saw blade for osteotomies usually larger incision compared to MIS and more used with the internal hardware fixation versus MIS. We use um, one of the that drill Dr. Aisham just mentioned. It's a high, no, sorry, low speed, high torque. So it prevents uh, burning the bones or soft tissue, less traumatic to uh, the soft tissue. So we use that specialized drill. Osteotomies and exostectomies can be done. Two to three millimeter incisions and most cases, there's no need for fixation. Again, um, I, I'd love to say surgeon's discretion at the end of the day, but in my opinion, and then again, Dr. Aisham here and many other minimally invasive surgeons all around the world, pretty much almost there's no need for fixation on most osteotomies. Almost, I said, and surgeon's discretion. So 
That part we'll discuss at the, after this presentation about fixation internally or not. So typical open end incision, that's a typical this side incision portal for revere denition, uh, aching type of procedure, that's a revere denition. So let me give you a quick overview. Again, a lot of slides and photos here, credit to Dr. Steven Aisham and Mariano De Prado from his textbook, Minimally Invasive for Surgery. By the way, I want to find the good time to uh, mention this. I know, because uh, you guys know about, you know, like, bad rap or history of minimally invasive surgery back in the 80s. That's the main reason why most traditional surgeons in, in now, nowadays almost like never heard about MIS. Where I'm getting at, where most MIS surgeons had to shy away or, or hide away because of those um, kind of bad rap and incident back in the day. True master. You know, this is why I, I, I love him and I respect him. True master of any field, in my opinion. I can say this with confidence because I'm big in martial arts and I see this common characteristic from any masters of their own field. They defend it like hell because they know what they believe in. They know what that can provide to help public health and patients. They don't go away, they don't give up, they don't give in. Dr. Aishan is prime example of that. He decided to educate even more. So he started traveling abroad. You know, when US is under attack in a way, the MIS was under attack, he continued his journey by educating thousands, literally thousands of thousands of orthopedic surgeons all around the world. If you look at the first page of what we call Bible of Minimally Invasive Surgery written by, well, Minimally Invasive Surgery, that's the title, written by uh, Mariano de Prado, um, well-known orthopedic foot surgeons in Spain. And he was the chair of uh, or Minimally Invasive Surgery for an ankle uh, in Europe for many years. He wrote a textbook. If you open the first cover, it says this book, is dedicated to Stephen Aishan. So he continued to defend what he believed in and what he has had a passion and continued to travel and educated all these orthopedic surgeons. That's why we have minimally invasive surgery modernized, improved, and the up level it can be done in a sterilized environment and safest way to provide the best treatment options utilizing these MIS techniques. So I want you guys to take time and appreciate masters of any field. So these are some examples of journals and articles written by um, other doctors. Only on the left-hand side, that's a manuscript of his original Revere Denisham technique. But on the right hand side, you start seeing they're talking about revered denial technique on, I mean, performed and studied by other orthopedic surgeons. So this one is from Journal of Orthopedic Surgery and Research. I'm just gonna go results. By the way, if you guys need any copy, you wanna see actual reference, reach out to me, tjan at drtjan.com. That's my web, uh, web email address. I'll, I'll be happy to send you this uh, reference. Results, revered in Aisham, here we go. Revered in Aisham and Akin percutaneous osteotomy of with a 48 month follow-up, AOFAS score was 87.15. And final follow-up 48 month, the VAS score was 8.35 uh, out of 10. Significant improvement compared to preoperative values. Another article, orthopedics and traumatology um, by Bauer and Biao. Conclusion, percutaneous correction of mild to moderate hallux valgus by Revirdin Aisha Mostiatomy provided, provided clinical results that were comparable to those of most minimally invasive 
or conventional procedures with 89% patient satisfaction and very satisfied at two years follow-up. So if some colleagues of us say minimally invasive surgery is not evidence-based, please, um, I'm gonna be a little harsh on here and it, that's an ignorant comment. There are hundreds of articles and studies published on percutaneous osteotomies. You just have been possibly blinded. There are articles all over, mostly written by orthopedic surgeons. So if you are attending this webinar tonight from tomorrow, please don't say MIS is not evidence-based. It is evidence-based. Okay, so revered in Aisha osteotomy treatment goal, correct all the deformities of hallux valgus, both soft tissue and osseous components, and recuperate and maintain function um, of first MTPJ. So beautiful thing about revered in Aisha osteotomy, it corrects multiple, it's like three-dimensional correction. It corrects HAV angle, IM angle, PASA angle, and DASA angle. Again, if you have any questions, please type your questions in the chat box and we will ad address every questions you ask at the end of the webinar. So revered denation typically goes that small incision and then you shave off the medial eminence first. So here's a little demonstration of photos, again, credited to Dr. Aisham and textbook by Mariano de Prado. That is dissection of cadaver. Usually these pictures were taken after uh, surgeons perform MIS procedures and well-known anatomist who is unfortunately passed away, he dissected out layer by layer to demonstrate how little damage that gets done into soft tissue or muscles or tendons or ligaments, um, other, other uh, soft tissue structures. Uh, am I correct, Dr. Aisha? Yes, yes, as long as it's performed properly. <laughs> as long as you do it the right way. That's right. right. <laughs> and then the next, this demonstrates the actually shaving off with um, 3.1 burn there. And then the, here's what Dr. Aisham earlier describes as that DD dorsal distal right here, dorsal distal right below proximal to the cartilage and then proximal plantar that angulated wedge osteotomy corrects PASA angle and compress the osteotomy when patients weight bear. And what I found also because of that angulation, it derotates the head uh, of, because of the medial wedge, sesamoid position, um, it, it, it gets improved. And then there is the, the typical uh, aching procedure here. And then it demonstrates right here about that DD2PP, dorsal distal to proximal plantar angle of osteotomy. Um, another cadaver lab demonstration of how osteotomy was performed. Okay. And this demonstrates how this corrects the PASA angle by wedge osteotomy. You're looking at the AP view of first metatarsal. The, because of the wedge, when they compress, it corrects the PASA. And this demonstrates the uh, aching angle. This is about dorsal medial incision and sweeping manner from medial plantar and coming up, leaving the lateral cortex intact and creates wedge osteotomy of the proximal phalanx of hallux. And then you can see as it compresses, it close, it corrects that HA angle. Some, demos, some uh, x-ray case study before and after. Again, this is shortened version. If you come to our Cadaver Lab conference, uh, Dr. Aisha usually have a full lecture on revered in Aisha osteotomy. So um, here is a revered in Aisha, a lesser metatarsal, metatarsal osteotomy of 234, and also the Aisha hammer to correction right there. This seems to be right after uh, in surgery. And this image is from Dr. Aisha. This is my case, revered in Aisha. Uh, before actually dressing the post-op, so you can still see the gap there. 
And I did on here um, sliding. I, you know, the reverberation is typically lateral cortex intact, but if you're not happy, you can complete the lateral cortex through and through, and then you can slide over. And I did the hammer to correction. Could have been better, could have been more transverse and a little bit more at the base. But what I can tell you also to you guys is that most MIS procedures are very forgiving, very, very forgiving meaning patient has almost minimal pain and you can adjust it within 72 hours. Uh, if you're not happy with osteotomy or the corrected position, because there's no fixation, you can still adjust the osteotomy to better positioning and put uh, splinting and bandaging. Here's another case, before and after. This one, I believe this, watch this clinical, Looks beautiful. If you look at the x-ray to traditional open surgeons, oh, that looks crook crooked and stuff like that. But again, every actual uh, positioning, most doctors here, I don't know what else you, you would have done with a traditional open. Patient was turned down um, other than uh, lapidus or like first MTPJ fusion and arthroplasties of all the toes and while procedure with the fixation, Patient didn't want to go with the fixation and she found me and then she's very happy. This, I believe it's like eight months after you can see all the osteotomies were ossified, healed properly. And typically after six months more from here, you won't even see all this line of osteotomies. There's another before and right after. Before and after, it's there. So now I'd like to ask Dr. Aisham um, a few more, you know, questions. Now, what's your take on internal, you know, fixation with metal or wire versus non-fixation? That's a hot topic, especially when it comes to first ray. It depends what procedure you are doing. Obviously, you could do a procedure that necessitates fixation, like uh, it's popular among. The French, uh, my French students and I that started doing this around 2000, uh, the French were doing a lot of wild osteotomies for lesser metatarsals and traditional hammer toe procedures, et cetera. Well, they have abandoned uh, the forefoot basically except for the first ray to uh, MIS and they do not fixate any of those. However, the first ray they like to fixate and they do like to move that first metatarsal, slide it over with a modified uh, like chevron. And they, sh they just slide it over so far that it's in the inner space that there's no way it's gonna stay there unless you fixate it. And so they use two big screws to do that. I see no need unless you open it up and loosen everything up. But if you do it pericutaneously, you leave all the, the uh, capsule and cat intact, the extensors and flexors are intact. And so therefore you can do your osteotomy and there's no need for uh, uh, to fixate your Aikens. I haven't fixated an Aiken almost ever. So from the uh, uh, early 19, late 1970s till now, I have not fixated an Aiken. Sure, I can say, yeah, uh, the surgeon has the prerogative to do that or not, but if I can get it done without fixating, then if you fixate, you're uh, spending money you don't need and uh, you're doing unnecessary surgery. But I won't say that in a court. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a prerogative, but uh, that's my personal opinion. And it's demonstrated by, you know, literally tens of thousands of cases throughout the world. So there are actually, uh, the French has an organization they call uh, Grey Pic or Grey Mies. And there's another orthopedic organization that is formed that uh, say, well, we disagree with the fixation. We don't use fixation. And so even among them, but among your orthopedic, our orthopedic colleagues, uh, fixation versus non-fixation is not a big deal. If you don't want to fixate it, that's fine. They've been fixing uh, fractures for eons uh, without fixation or cone fixation, whatever you need. Bear in mind that the bones of the foot are real tiny. 
Uh, if you do an arthroplasty, excuse me, if you do an arthrodesis, that's where an indication to fixate is higher because you're fooling the body. The body says, wait a minute, I'm supposed to have a joint here and it's gonna to want a formal joint. So you're gonna to have to fool the, joint, the body. And so in that case, a fixation tool or a device of some sort uh, uh, is probably uh, more indicated than not. But I don't fixate hardly anything. Obviously, there's some rear foot stuff that you wanna do. If you do triple arthrodesis, you can do the, all that minimal invasive. You can do uh, Dwyer osteotomies. Uh, that's that's all done percutaneously, and of course they you use a couple screws for that. So there are things that you use that more in the rear foot, but in the forefoot, uh, I uh, I uh, say well you can use it if you want, but it's totally unnecessary. What about uh, base procedure of first met? What is your opinion? Okay. Okay, with the Robert Nisham uh, Aiken procedure, that was originally designed, designed for mild to moderate uh, halitus valgus deformities. And so if you have an intermetatarsal angle and of uh, uh, like 18 degrees plus, and the patient is uh, younger than 50 years old, you should consider an additional procedure to close that intermetatarsal angle to increase your long-term success rate. And you can do that by doing a uh, base osteotomy, or you can slide the head over, but the more severe the bunion deformity is, as you slide the head over, you end up jamming the metatarsal cuneiform joint into hyperpronation and uh, the range of motion stops, almost like if you did a lapidus, and therefore you restrict the dorsal flexion of the hallux, that causes more hallux limitus. So uh, if you review your patho mechanics of the foot and what causes things, the first ray has to plantar flex in order to allow the uh, hallux to dorsiflex. That at the MPJ joint, it's only about 25 degrees, give or take. But if it plantar flexes, the, how, the first ray plantar flexes, then it increases that movement to up to 90 degrees. So uh, if you fuse, if you do lapidus, you're limiting the uh, function of the first ray and the function of the perineal longus that helps plantar flex that. So I'll just throw that out there at you guys. Cool. Okay, there I have a question here that says, uh, how does the cess boy mode move back position when the head is not being moved laterally? Well, <clears throat> with the reverse nice procedure, and you've seen with a couple of the x-rays, there was no base osteotomy, but the intermetatarsal angle decreased. And it decreased because uh, you changed the biomechanical function. And it's that bolstering effect that when the sesboid bones are displaced, if you want to say displaced, it's the bones that are displaced, uh, actually pushes the first metatarsal more medially. But after doing the revert nice osteotomy and drakin, now that, power, that force of the extensors and flexors is now straight back. And so the first ray is not pushed medially. And so that closes the intermetatarsal angle. Now, the sesamoid bones have been laterally displaced for quite some time, but they still are, most of the cases, they still articulate with the first metatarsal head. And so with time, they have created a functional cartilage there. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that medial wedge osteotomy, but obliquely from dorsal distal to plantar proximal, that rotates that functional cartilage. And with it, the, uh, that causes the, the intermetatarsal angle to close and the sesamoid bones to stay in their functional cartilage area. I wrote this rotating. So that's how you can do, that's how that, uh, I don't have to play around with the sesamoid bones. And I learned that not having to play my, around with the sesamoid bones from Dale Austin the bone debris in the osteotomy site. 
So you got a bone to graft there. And uh, so that also speeds up the healing process. So I hope I've answered your question. Uh, yes. Because well, many doctors have been helping. They were concerned, especially traditionally trained uh, you know, colleagues, when they look at x-rays without fixation, you know, most of them get scared. Like, you know, are they, what, if there, is there any case of non-union? And I know the answer already, but I'd like to hear from you. Okay, you can have the non-union, but uh, it is rare with a properly performed uh, uh, lesser metatarsal osteotomy. Otherwise the French wouldn't have abandoned their uh, wild osteotomy. Uh, but sometimes you have to realize if you look at the x-ray, you go, well, it's a plantar flex metatarsal. I can see by the cortices and the length or whatever the termination that we have a metatarsal problem with the, with the keratosis underneath it or a diabetic ulcer underneath it. So you go, well, I got to do something and you cut it and the patient bears weight and it moves. Well, it's supposed to move. And sometimes it moves where it's supposed to go. And uh, so the body's going to move that bone to where it needs to go to resolve the pathology that that patient has. So uh, we try to guide it a little bit so it doesn't go too far with our dressings and that, but uh, it's supposed to move. So uh, I think with the, as your surgical skills with MIS improve, there's less displacement. The more you do your osteotomies in the diaphysis, the more displacement you're going to have. The more you do it at the surgical neck, we're talking about lesser metatarsals, the less displacement you're going to have. Pioneers like Dr. Aisha, they're the ones who went through trials and errors. And I don't want you to go trial and error, especially now, you know, this modern society with all these insurance issues and all that, healthcare systems broken, do not reinvent the wheel. The fastest way, I believe, to implement these high demand MIS procedures, especially in your office based surgery, is to learn from somebody who has done it with a proven system. So skip the struggle. What if you have a system which shows you step by step, right? Um, especially help you implement an MIS fast and effectively, and business system that can create seven figure, what I call Zen podiatry practice, not relying on volume and insurance hassles, right? Um, I do have a proven mentorship program. One is MIFAS Accelerator, and the other one is the Mastermind. My MIS Accelerator program only focus on helping you implement minimally invasive surgery with cadaver lab, online course, weekly coaching calls. It has proven to many colleagues who's now performing minimal invasive surgery in their office. If you want to develop further and build marketing skills and how to build strong, um, profitable private practice model, I do have a mastermind. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to grow your private practice with me, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Oh, I forgot to mention, I have a description below where you can click and watch the replay of the webinar I did on MIS more in depth. Not only the benefits of MIS and academic side of it, but I also presented practice management side, practice growth aspect by implementing minimally invasive surgery in your practice. So don't forget to check that out. It's in the description below and I'll see you in the next video.